I'm Katie Cowan, and this is the Creative Boom Podcast, a weekly show that's unfiltered and lighthearted, featuring candid conversations with a diverse mix of creatives from all over the world. For episode 67, my guest is Ben Tallon, an illustrator who has two decades of experience in the field with a hand-drawn style that's lively, loud and expressive. One that has done him proud across many disciplines, from print and digital to animation, set design and large-scale media. And it's also attracted clients such as The Guardian and UNICEF. His debut book, Champagne and Wax Crayons, was published in 2015 to much acclaim. It offers an honest account of what it means to be a creative today. Since then, he's won an award, written a few more books and started his own podcast, Creative Condition, which is how I first met Ben many years ago when he asked to interview me about Creative Boom. He grew up in Keeley, West Yorkshire, where he loved Leeds United, wrestling and video games, things that clearly inspire his art today. Ben kindly popped round to my house in Manchester in September when I was just starting to put this third season together. Not surprisingly, Ben shares his experience of being a freelance illustrator and what he's learned over the past 20 years. It's an inspiring conversation with someone who is full of passion and determination and who has this innate ability to capture the many ups and downs of modern life. But first, a word from our sponsor, one of the most powerful photo editing softwares out there, Capture One creates world-class tools that keep your photography ahead of the game. With powerful editing features, unmatched colour handling and the industry's fastest tethered shooting, it offers the ultimate seamless workflow for creatives, both in and outside of the studio. Use the code CREATIVEBOOM to get a 10% discount at Capture One and start taking your photography to the next level. Just go to CaptureOne.com. Now, here's my chat with Ben. Ben Tallon, hello. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Um, we're in my dining room. This feels very surreal. <laughs> mm, it does. It's great. We've talked in a lot of places, but never your dining room before. I know. It, it, I, I, we've just had the most crazy couple of years. And, um, you know, I find that, uh, you know, whenever I go and do anything, what you deem normal at the moment, it's it can be a bit overwhelming, can't it? It can feel, mm. is this is this actually real? <laughs> it's, there is a lot of that at the minute. We had, had some drinks with a few of the designers on Friday and a few of them said they were, they'd forgotten how to socialise. And, you know, like we got to the bar and it's just this massive bumbling pack of people. Not, no one knows to buy a drink. No one knows who to say yes to the offered drink. And it was Dave Sedgwick who said, they said, I, I love the idea that someone just kind of gets so overwhelmed that they just run off down the street and leave their wallet and phone and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that happening. Absolutely. And it worked all the old usual crowd there, Barney and Danny. And- yeah. And then I think everyone was just very, like, everyone had a twinkle in their eye. You know, no one... I think everyone's discipline went out the window very quickly. Did it feel like Christmas Eve back home in the, in the local pub? It did you... have that feel, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it did very much so. Yeah, we're, <laughs> old, we're old, kind of, you know, you've buried the hatchet with everyone and yeah. <laughs> everybody's just got love in their eyes. Yeah, and... happy to even see those idiots from school that you t- <laughs> tried, tried to avoid all those years. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you've been really busy um, since we sort of, well, last saw each other in person. Um, you've got two little additions to the family and mm. you yeah, got married and <laughs> parenthood, marriage, yeah, books. It's been it has been it's been busy, but it also hasn't. It's been like I mean, particularly at work, it's hit this I've been doing it nearly thirteen years now, freelance, and it's hit this nice thing where I will be intensely busy for longer periods of time, but then there'll be bigger gaps in between the projects. Whereas, yeah. you know, the early days I was an editorial illustrator, more or less exclusively, and that was just fast and furious, you know, four jobs in and out the door in two days and yeah. everyone needs it yesterday. So there was a real intensity there and it was no let up. Whereas now it's like one project, focus on said project, and then there's a nice gap to do something I want to do. So it's, the dynamics shifted, which is nice. So yeah, busy, busy in personal life, crazy busy, but work more... <laughs> different dynamic now yeah that's great I think um it's nice to see and um you know the style that you have I mean do you feel like it's evolved even though you kind of the way you work has changed yeah very much so I think it it's interesting isn't it I, I, I find it really interesting to observe different people's different styles and obviously to a degree it's always going to be a product of set of the self um 
But yeah, I mean, the evolution of it, it's still very raw and scruffy and that's all it can be because that's me. <laughs> um, but it has evolved, yeah. You know, I'm, I've been blessed with a whole string of wonderful creative directors and people from other disciplines and then just people from outside the arts who make suggestions that create a whole new, you know, different, different direction, be it subtle or be it fundamental. Um, so it has, it's, it's moved a lot. It's one of those surprising things when you're a creative person, you, especially when you run your own business, you know, you, you don't expect that there's going to be all these different things that you're solving and moving on from and changing. And it, it's a, it, it can be frustrating, but it can be massively satisfying seeing the progress you're making. Oh God, yeah. And I, and I find it goes through these, for me personally, it's gone through these patterns of there'll be times when it's utterly chaotic where I'm trying to do 50 things at once and I've bitten off way more than I can chew. <laughs> But there's great value in those spells because even though you tend to hit a burnout or a spell where you just have to drop some and cut things back, you learn a lot in the, in, in all those things, whether it's something that just hasn't worked and it's fallen on its ass or whether it's something that's, you know, becomes a new part of what you do. There's great worth to all that. And then you hit periods where you just have to go back and concentrate on something again because you've gone too far the other way. Yeah. And that's where mine tends to do it. If, you know, if you looked at it in a graph, I think there'd be a very regular pattern going on to that degree mm. over the years. Yeah, I think that's something people, when they first start out, don't realise. It's quite a natural process to go through. The ups and downs, the highs mm. and lows, the confidence crashes. Um, I think I did pretty well to get through to maybe a couple of years ago, I think it was, when I had a massive crash and thought, oh my God, what am I doing? Um, but actually that whole thing was very helpful for me because it just made me sit back and go, okay, right, what do I need to do mm. to to make my work practices better, my life better. So anyone who's just starting out, if, if they're kind of, especially with, with the challenges of the pandemic and everything we've been through, it, I mean, they'll be reassured to know that there are going to be these moments where, you know, you have to try and figure things out and move forward. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's all of what we do in, in the arts is, a, is driven by feeling and personality and, and individuality and our, you know, it's our... I was writing actually about this recently and I described it as if you really want to strip it back, you know, what creativity is, it's, 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 there's two pillars. It's, it's what's inside, inside us and it's what's out there and creativity really is an act. It's, it's the kind of, it's, it's the marriage of those two things. It's the expression of you, your take on what's going on out there really. Yeah. You know? And that, and that can be a myriad things, but I think that you're working it out all the time, always. And your personality changes and you have mood dips and you have highs and lows like anybody else. And I think the difference between what we tend to do, no matter what it is in the arts, and what people do in, in roles that are maybe more, you know, maybe nine five or it's you very much got a task sheet to get through, is that it is dependent on all those factors. So of course you're gonna get crashes and pitfalls and and then these major tear moments where you maybe have a few <laughs> months of, you know, when you post it on Instagram, it just looks like incredible success and so yeah, it fluctuates all the time and you're never too far away from the next challenge, the next hurdle or the next hole, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think when we're in the middle of that kind of, you know, phase of where it feels like nothing's working and we haven't quite figured out what's happening next, what what kind of do you what do you kind of do? What do you reach for? What kind of tools in your bag do you go for? These days I I like I look inward a lot more. I used to look out and think Oh, what should I be doing? You know, what's the what what's the next step? What's progression? You know, do I need to expand? Do I need to set up an agency? What's I don't really ever think like that anymore. And I'll just think, what why am I feeling dissatisfied with this? And is it kind of if it's comparison and I'm seeing other people and feeling like I'm inadequate, that's wrong because you shouldn't have a you know, this was a classic thing, comparison is the the thief of joy. Yes. It's very true. And it, and it's so pertinent in today's world because we're exposed to all this stuff. But I just start, I stop and take a moment now, and I never used to do that. I used to be, um, I think we talked about it before, and we, you know, we both admitted to being to a degree a bull in a china shop in younger years in different ways. <laughs> yes. Um, and there is because when you're passionate about what you do, you, you want it all now. You yeah. Know, and you get a taste of it, and it's a, it's a, it becomes an addiction sometimes. But I just step back now and, and take some time off, you know, watch a film, read a book, go for a walk. Sometimes do nothing, which is really underrated. And, you know, sometimes it's just a bad day. Yeah. I, I tend to really put a magnifying glass over those bad days and blow it up to something that it's not. Go downstairs and complain to my wife who'll very quickly tell me to show up and say, you're doing fine, you know that, you know, X, Y, and Z, you're going to be fine tomorrow. And it, and it tends to be. So I'm, 
It depends. You have to first work out whether it's something that needs to be addressed or whether you are just having a bit of a mood dip and it's kind of step away and come back in a few days' time. And in, usually that tends to work it out. But if it's not and it's something more fundamental, then I, I, I don't know. I think about, do I need to change things? Do I need to evolve? Do I need to take a step into something else? I don't, you know, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of change, like less so these days. Yeah. You mentioned um, the fact that, you know, when you're in those sort of low moments and, and, you know, you might start like comparing yourself to other people. That's something I found, you know, happened to me in that big confidence crash of 2018. <laughs> and, and I did start looking around. I was like, oh, God, you know, why can't I be better? You know, and, and I think it's very normal in those moments to just start comparing. And I think in my toolkit now, I just sort of, the minute I feel that I'm going down that path, I'll say, right, no, let's focus on what you're good at. And I think that's the thing that, uh, you know, really helps when you're in those moments of despair and mm -hmm. it's just getting back to what makes you, you. And I think of all the illustrators that I've ever come across, you have such a distinct uh, tone of voice and style. I feel that is like probably one of your biggest strengths. You've just really been able to not only kind of carve your niche, but it, you know, you keep coming back again and again to, to what makes you uniquely you with your stories, with your, with your illustrations, mm. with, with everything you do. And it's, um, it, it's encouraging and it's, it's, you know, it gives me courage anyway. <laughs> Thank you. No, it was, I always placed a really high value from a very early stage in my career on, on doing things on my own terms, because I was, I just, I'd been lucky to have a wonderful time at design college and then at uni and met so many interesting people. That, but I, I always was drawn to, whether it was books, films, other artists, things with such a strong voice. And, and I think subconsciously I understood that I needed to tap into that if I was going to make my mark as a, as a freelance illustrator. And it wasn't in terms of being successful or anything like that. It was enjoying the work that I was doing. So invariably, like any other new artist, I got a lot of commissions that I didn't love doing at the start and took everything on because I was just thrilled to be an illustrator and to be able <laughs> to make some money from that. So I took all sorts on, and I, but I always paid careful attention to what I liked to do, what yeah. made me excited to go into the studio and what gave me the opposite feeling and therefore didn't put those things in my portfolio if it didn't make me feel good. And even for a good number of years, and even now, I, there's a, a healthy percentage of personally initiated work in there for that reason. Because I knew that I could go and replicate commissions that I'd done, corporate jobs for financial magazines and things, yeah. and make, make, make good money and keep doing that. But it didn't, it didn't matter what money I made or what, how successful it seemed. If I wasn't feeling good about it, that was everything to me. Yeah. And, and I always just knew that that kind of loose, you know, inky, frenetic style thrilled me I loved doing it mm -hmm. and luckily I got some really important honest advice from people with more experience than me early on who got me away from trends driven work because I did I went down the path of looking in the Guardian or Days and Confused all these cool commissioned illustrations and going well that must be what they want yeah um, we all do that finds that trap very briefly oh god yeah luckily the, the very frank advice said to me, look, your collage. It was Danny Allison, who's an illustrator and photographer, and he, we shared a studio. And he said to me, "There are a thousand better people out there, there that you know, colours and that collage than this stuff that you're doing. However, you're drawing is second to none. There's a real energy to it. There's a real life to it. When did you stop using that as the lead in your illustration?" Yeah. And I couldn't answer the question. I didn't know when. I, I guess because I came out of uni without tutorial input yeah. and peer support. And on my own, suddenly thought, well, that's what I'd better be doing because that's what's being commissioned. Yeah. Um, so when I got back on that horse, the buzz that I got from creating this quick, energetic work and embracing the fact that the simplicity could be as valid as complexity, uh, the feeling was, you know, magnificent. Amazing. So I always led with that in my portfolio. And therefore, it didn't take too long to kind of wean out the stuff that, I, that was better for somebody else that didn't suit my personality. I can see you coming to life as well when you start talking about it in that way. It's mm. like, you know, we, we, we talk about the lows and now we're talking about the highs and, and you touch on a perfect bit of wisdom there when you say, uh, you know, if you just focus on what you love, then the rest sort of comes naturally. And it's very true. And it, it's kind of, it's it's the kind of centre of finding your tone of voice as well, I think. Just what is it that, you know, if you're really stuck and you've gone down this path and it's, it's far down the path and you're lost and confused and you're getting 
pulled left, right and centre, you're worried that you're not, you know, trendy enough or, you know, you're not, there's not enough colour in your work. Stop, you know, yeah. go back to the drawing board, go back to basics and ask that really simple question. What do you love doing? Yeah. What do you like doing? What makes, what processes do you enjoy doing? If you don't, and if you don't yet know, keep experimenting until you find out. Exactly. You might stumble upon something wonderful. It was, there was a whole, there was a, a lovely sequence of events and it was from, the first kind of portfolio I did, there was a lot of like, you know, political, social comment in there in, in my, my stupid kind of clumsy way. That I did it. <laughs> but what I did was um, it, it started from an in-joke in the studio with Danny Ellis, who I just mentioned. I did this, you know, I'm a big wrestling fan and I did this ridiculous kind of old school <laughs> boxing style poster. Um, and it was me versus Danny and I just put illustration death match, Talon versus Amazing. Alison. He has this ridiculous image of him with a toilet seat around his neck from, <laughs> from a night out that we had. And then me with a stupid tracksuit and a big cigar. And it was completely silly just to make him laugh, basically. Yeah. And it was Talon versus Alison, illustration death match, Preston uh, fish market toilets. It was just stupidity, really. <laughs> but I did it and it looked kind of cool. So, you know, I did it. And then he said, what about a versus series? Why, don't, why not keep doing these versus moments? And I did a Obama versus Clinton in 2008, and it was for the, I think, the Democrat leader. Oh, right. Obama politics, I can't remember. But it was when they were both going for leader, and all the press around it at the time was that Barrett would be the first black president and Hillary would be the first female president. And it annoyed me because I could see that for myself, and I get now, I'm a bit more mature now, I understand the need for that conversation. But I was like, well, tell me something more about the policies rather than, you know, who they are. And that way it was just a comment on that and I called it the race versus sex challenge. And it was the same kind of <laughs> idea in this, this poster. And I, t I put that in my portfolio reluctantly because I thought it was maybe a little too edgy, but I left it in there anyway. I thought, well, why, why am I doing this otherwise? I love Banksy's work. I love all these graphic activists. If I can't have a little bit of crackle in there, yeah, then exactly. why, am, why am I doing it? And it was Roger Browning, who was the design director at The Guardian at the time, who saw that in my portfolio. And he said he loved like, the edge to it. He liked mm. the, the comment and he liked the, the energy and the simplicity of it. And then um, for that reason, he said he'd keep me in mind for work at The Guardian. And to his word, he did get me my first commission there. Um, and I continued that series. And then I did Tyson versus Thatcher. Again, this, this stupid <laughs> world collided. It just got, it just become a, you know, oh. a thing. And that got some press in Computer Arts Magazine. And it was that poster that got me my first job outside of editorial for, yeah. sure, for E4 doing a Skins animated TV trailer for the new season. Amazing. Again, I remember it well, actually. Yeah. But it was just a lovely, it was a lovely kind of real time learning experience of why you should do that stuff that's completely personal and ridiculous. Yeah. Even if you think it's not going to fit into a trend or not be picked up by an art director, because you'd be, I'm constantly shocked to this day by what actually is picked up and run with and, and, you know, it doesn't mean that they see that and commission that same thing, yeah. but they might see a theme that you haven't recognised within that work and give you a whole different project or suggest something you might never have thought of because they've got a more seasoned eye, you know? Yeah. And, and that was a really early pivotal learning curve for me. Yeah, 2008, when you went freelance, mm -hmm. financial crash had yeah. just happened. You know, mm -hmm. that must have been a... An exciting, dramatic time. Well, it was. I never knew anything else. So that was my starting point, you know. So I, I was, I guess, for illustrators who've been around and seen bigger fees and whatever else, that perhaps that was a, a big wake-up call or, a, you know, something of an earth shake for them. But for me, no, it was that was what I came into and I was already scratching around on pennies. So it was like, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is the environment. So, so be it. It's, it feels like a long time ago. I mean, I'm trying to think what actually happened that year. It was like, obviously, Obama became president. Mm. Um, Duffy was in the charts with Mercy. Yeah. Does that make you feel old? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the year that Spotify launched. Wow, is that right? Yeah, and Android was released. Oh. And Man United won their third European Cup. They beat Chelsea. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it, it was a, kind of a big year, really. Um, and mm. it was obviously... You know, it's on the Wikipedia page for the pivotal moments of 2008. It was when you went freelance. <laughs> <laughs> of course. God, I mean, what it was, it was, I took an approach of having a full-time job because I knew that, you know, my character, I wouldn't deal well with immediate financial pressure. Hmm. And I knew some people, Danny being one of them, who who just threw themselves in the deep end and quit their job and sink or swim approach, and that worked for them. Gosh, uh, and I, I would encourage any you know anyone who's coming into it to to really lead with character. You know, will you deal well with 
financial pressure and then being out there on your own, maybe when you've had a long time of studying with peers and tutors and lovely studio spaces and universities. <laughs> yeah. You know, to think about that because I, I was, luckily I did think about that and I, and I knew that I wouldn't and, and I didn't. And I had a full-time job of all sorts, you know, factories and just whatever the, the employment agency basically mm. sent me. Yeah, um, same. And, and then Preston <laughs> City Council was a recycling officer. So that worked well for me because I could finance the dream and I could do it in my evenings and weekends at my leisure and take my time to do it with the purity that we just talked about. Yeah. Uh, and that worked for me because I didn't then, you know, I didn't go and do the corporate stuff because I needed to make the money, you know. So then there's no reason anyone can't stop and implement those changes now. Yeah. Like I talked to Laura Hope yesterday about that very thing, who's an illustrator who's put that on pause and taken a, an art gallery management job because the money, the security will give her the freedom to think about what she really wants to do creatively. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm looking forward to listening to that because that's that's quite an unusual that you know story to sort of go the other way. And again, there's just no shame in it. There's, you know, if we can, if we're finding ourselves on a treadmill, then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's time to sort of make a change and, and yeah. figure something else out. There's you nothing know. wrong with getting off it and taking a job that's completely disconnected from the arts until you work out what it is and mm -hmm. starting again, you know. I think, um, I t I, you know, I sometimes find you, you do get a little bit of backlash sometimes. People are like, well, that's all well and good for that person who's done that lecture saying that, you know, that we should do this and we should do that. And I think that, um, <laughs> and they are being a bonnet going, well, I've got four kids or whatever and I don't have the time to do that. But these talks are never about that you specifically I know, why do they do take that, that angle? And I think, I think because we... I think it goes back to it being connected to what we do, being connected to our personalities. Again, we do take things personally and we do tend to, um, you know, get almost angry with people who are saying that something is a certain way for them. Yeah. But it's it's about looking at the, the theme of what they're talking about and applying it to your world. And it, that's fine if you can't do that or you don't have the time. Yeah. But then if that's a problem and that you don't have the time, how do you restructure and how do you change your practice to make sure that it's not, you know? Yeah, And that exactly. goes back to the change we talked about. You shouldn't, people shouldn't be scared of starting again or making a fundamental shift if that's what they need to do to get happier. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think the last, you know, I keep saying the last 18 months, like, is it coming up to two years, the pandemic? Um, it's kind of been a massive shift for many people. And in some cases it hasn't, you know, um, people have really reassessed their lives and where they're at. Um, mm -hmm. how, how have you found it yourself personally? Because I know plenty of creatives who've gone, oh my God, you know, roll sleeves up, get absolutely mm -hmm. stuck in, worked harder than they've ever worked in their lives. And then other people have just gone, actually, no, I'm going to sort of just shift the focus a little bit use this time to sort of take a step back reassess you know I, I suppose it's all down to people's personal sort of financial situations yeah. as well that definitely plays a part it really is yeah there's a lot of factors that come into it for me personally it didn't it didn't change too much i had a couple of lulls early on workflow wise just because projects got derailed because of covid you know uh, yeah. for whatever reasons but really it didn't change a great deal and i guess i put that down to um my portfolio is very diverse Sometimes that can be a bad thing if people can't yeah. quite understand it. If it's not doesn't have that one specialism like a Stan Chow who's got a very digestible, understandable thing that he does. Yeah. Um, but mine goes the other way to that. And but the good thing about that is it, it caters for so many markets and it can be applied to a lot of different things. So whereas some things fell down because of the pandemic, other things got a boost. So yeah. I saw a rise in animated jobs, you know, for like sports clients because home entertainment went through the roof because we were all stuck in our houses. Yeah. And I picked up a, a number of animated like TV trailers and things like that off the back of it. So yeah. it was just a very subtle shift for me, really. And um, I was already in a position where I was a new parent, so I was doing the minimum, you know. Yes. And luckily I'm blessed with a, a really good agent who I've built a good relationship with over the last decade or so, so that they do bring me enough of a trickle of work so that if I do, you know, want to put the brakes on, that, that tends to still come. So I very much... Len, you know, leaned on that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And that, that's actually something we're just asking the creative community at the moment, you know, their tips on, you know, how to get represented by an agent um, and, you know, the high, the, you know, the pros and the cons, I suppose. Um, what, what advice would you give to any illustrator listening to this, hoping to follow in your footsteps? Mm, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Agents tend to look for, they're not afraid, to, the, the ones I talk to, they're not afraid to take a chance on new artists, but they do want to see professionalism and experience, a little bit of experience. So they want to see you kind of up and running and you've found your groove almost before they'll 
bring you on the books. Right. Um, that's what I found, certainly with my agency, which is Illustration X. Um, they took me on at a, you know, uh, that portfolio that I mentioned to you earlier with the uh, <laughs> race sex challenge stuff and it. it was very raw, very early. And I look back now and I'm quite shocked that I was taken onto an agency with that. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I, if you want us to put that in an advice context, I would say, you know, be confident in your in your style and your direction and mm. before you go to get somebody to represent you because it's not it's not the answer, you know, they don't they, it, it's not this thing where you're taken onto the agency and suddenly it goes off. Quite the opposite. The agency needs you to meet them halfway and drive the conversations and, you know, let them know where you want to go and work with you. And, and then you have to listen to their advice and their market insights. Yeah. So it's a relationship like anything else. So I think, you know, do your homework with what, what areas the agency seems to work in and, and who the agency is and, and the size of it. Like yeah. Illustr- Illustration X is, is big. They represent over 200 artists worldwide. Wow. And do have offices in a lot of countries. That's good for me because I don't want to be full time busy all the time because I have you know the podcast and I do the writing and I like to keep that time free. But for other people, if you want to be nine five busy all the time, maybe uh, you know maybe that's not the right agency for you. Perhaps it's about being on a more boutique one that has the time to dedicate to you. I don't know, you know, but have those conversations with the agencies and, yeah. be, and be honest. You know? Absolutely, let them know what you're looking for and what you want. And and first of all, know what you what you want. If you don't, perhaps it's time to find that out on your own before you get representation. Yeah, just get a big kind of blank sheet of paper and start writing things right. down and exploring yeah. things. Well, like and- we said, go out there and find out, make a few mistakes, get a few stories before you know before you go looking for the what people seem to perceive as the holy grail. It yeah. can be the wrong thing to be trapped in the wrong agency, which I've seen happen to a lot of artists. Mm. You know, so, you know, I, don't, I think and much like maybe a new band might place, a, <laughs> you know, say the, the big thing is getting signed to a label. I think that world has gone. You know, I think you can do it on your own. We have the tools at our fingertips now, so it's not going to be right for everybody to be represented. We're taking a short break to get a word from our sponsor, Capture One, the powerful photo editing software that constantly innovates to give visual creators around the globe the ultimate creative tools. We spoke to Diego from Capture One, a photographer and videographer with over 15 years of experience and a background in photojournalism, music and art photography. I asked him, do you have any magic photo editing tips in post-production that can turn a good photograph into a great one? Well, uh, first is, of course, understanding where the image will be displayed, uh, because that kind of shapes the edit that you want to do. Uh, but my my uh, <laughs> wizard uh, photo editing is usually with Capture One, specifically using the advanced color editor to create masks. Uh, and, and you can create masks depending on the color selection. I think that is very, very helpful to to uh, turn your edit a little bit more expressive because since you have the masks divided by color, you can turn them a little bit more, you can saturate them a little bit more individually, you can turn them down and you can create a mood uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a very fast and simple way. Capture One creates world-class tools for editing, organizing and working with photos. Want to test the software? Simply use code CREATIVEBOOM for 10% off or sign up for a 30-day free trial. Go to captureone.com. Now, back to my chat with Ben. So why did you um, start the podcast and and go into the writing? Was it sort of just other creative outlets or was it kind of, were you in the back of your mind thinking these are other things that can pay the bills or? First and foremost, frustration. You started that sequence of events. (laughs) Like I'd been an illustrator for, when did the first book come out? 2015. But I actually started writing champagne and wax crayons in blog format in 2011. And that was, I'd been doing it three years and I hit, um, it wasn't a long spell in hindsight. It was six weeks, which is quite common to get a six week quiet spell. But I got a six week quiet spell after two very good years at the start. Mm-hmm. And you know, I got indignant. Oh, why is this happening now? I've been this two <laughs> years, you know. And it's crazy to look back at that now that I felt that way. But I did and I got very frustrated. Working at home in my bedroom, which I didn't deal particularly well with yeah. because of financial constraints. And I just moved to Manchester and, you know, I'm in this big city where it's going on. And I was in this bedroom in um, Molly Range and, hmm. you know, went down the rabbit hole to a degree. And during that quiet spell, when I should have been perhaps banging on doors to get new work in, 
I wasn't. I was writing and I was ranting on Twitter, uh, Tumblr. I was ranting on Twitter. Tumblr, good blog. grief. Yeah. Forgotten yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it started out as these quite venomous, um, you know, this is the reality. The Instagram stuff, not real. <laughs> that, was, that was the underlying sentiment in those posts. But what I, what I did find is that people liked the honesty and connected with it, even yeah. though it was maybe a little too, you know, angry at the time. Uh, but people gave wonderful feedback and says, this is, I like the way this is written. And, um, and it's, it's telling the other side of things, the kind of underbelly of the freelance world. Yeah. So I kept on writing and I kept on writing and then I got slightly better through practice. And eventually I realized I was building up enough to kind of put together a rough manuscript and thought, I wonder if there's, you know, a book in this. Is that ridiculous to think this could be a book? And um, as, as luck would have it at the time, I, I always find that when you're doing something from a place of passion and you share it with anyone somewhere, things happen, you know, someone will see it and connect with it in a way that you might not have considered. And Laura, who's now my wife, um, I started going out with her a few years after I'd started writing this blog. And she'd mentioned this blog to her editor at the time, who was David Woods. And David used to be the editor of HR magazine right. uh, for Haymarket. And he said, that sounds pretty interesting. And he started working for a boutique publisher in London called Lid at the time and he wanted to look at it and they offered me a book deal so it was like a very you know it sounds very simple sequence of events but I think I look back at that it's quite great. important because you do it I did that so I did that from an angry frustrated place <laughs> negative emotions things you wouldn't choose so your advice is get really angry mm. have, a, have a quiet spell and you never know what could happen I just think there's great value in the in the, in the negative spectrum absolutely you, you don't choose it but it happens shit happens yeah and I think it's about how you like anything in life it's how you respond to it you know it's yeah. how you deal with it because it's going to happen people are negative about being negative aren't they yes and it's actually part of the human condition <laughs> it really is and it's a big part of the great cycle too because look at all the great work Work that comes out of social oppression and any kind of negative, you know, time in pop culture, for example. Yeah. That's a whole other story. But um, Oh, gosh, yes. But I did that. And, and you know, like I said, I should say that I'd, I'd extracted the venom from it after a while. I realised I was a too angry young man, so I deleted all these early posts and <laughs> went to a more objective, let's look at both sides of things and, and yeah. why it's important to talk about that. Anyway, David loved it, worked with him, who was a great editor. And, you know, it turned into this non-fiction, what's and all kind of story of taking creativity and turning it into a career and that you know that came out then it was like you know I started to get talks at universities and things and loved all of the media side of it and then fell in love with that because yeah I guess I'm a social person and I've just always grown up loving these conversations around creativity and here was this tool that I could make those things happen in a formal environment and then I talked to Harry Lyon Smith who is the MD of my agency and said I want to do more of this like you know if any opportunities come up through the agency um, I'd love to talk about that. And he yeah. said, well, there aren't any at the moment. We're starting a news portion of the website, but it's not really geared towards the way that you write. Right. However, I listen to 20-odd podcasts a week. And in, as the moment he said that, I realised I listen to about 20 podcasts a week. And he went, have you thought about podcasting? You yeah. Know, you're a talker. You you love it. You talk well about creativity. And again, it's just that little thing of putting it out into the world and somebody with more experience in recognising something that was very obvious but I couldn't see the wood for the trees because yeah. we don't often. And um, we don't. And bless Harry, you know, he said, right, well, we'll you know, we, we'll put up a little bit of sponsorship budget from the agency to get you off the ground if you want to do that so you can get the podcast and equipment and learn how to, you know, so go away and learn how to do it. Great. And I, and I did, and I thought, well, why not? I love the idea of having my own show and, and you know, it just found out how to do it watched a 14 year old kid on youtube explaining garage bands and <laughs> learned this very haphazard punky way of putting together a podcast and now it's like over 100 you know 70 episodes deep and i still don't know where i want it to go there's still no real direction for it yeah but it became this thing where i saw the opportunity to get a little bit more stability than just being a freelance illustrator yeah because i was always terrified at the idea that if freelance illustration for whatever reason or my freelance illustration took a major hit that I would suddenly be back at a deco or whatever employment agency <laughs> on the high street could get me in a factory and that was quite terrifying because I tasted the good stuff yeah exactly <laughs> you know so so here I saw that as an opportunity to broaden my skill set so mm -hmm. that if that happened perhaps I could go and look for something in broadcasting or you know writing or whatever and but again really it's just come down to what we said about feeling and about enjoying the process and finding out and I continue to do that and love doing that and you know it constantly amazes me what opportunities come from doing it 
it's amazing how as well in a network you can sort of you know start something beautiful with the people that you meet and you moved up to Manchester what how, how many years ago was it now? Five years? Uh, 2017, so getting on for four years. Gosh, yeah. And com- coming up from London and um, having all the sort of, you know, wonderful big city down there and then coming to this completely different place, which I'm, I'm assuming you would have dipped in and out of having grown up in the Northwest. Yes. Well, I, I, I yeah, I studied in Preston, moved to Manchester with a little a little break where I went to New Zealand for nearly a year. Uh, but oh. apart from that, I was in Manchester five years. Then I'd always loved the idea of going to London and living that big, buzzy lifestyle. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> Did yeah. Did that three years. But then what I missed was the balance of community and city that Manchester had. Right. And the tighter community. And um, I loved all of London. But then the minute you start to think about ever buying a house or, you know, slowing down All a those bit, kind of grown-up things. It quickly spits you back out. <laughs> yeah, and you find yourself on the, uh, yeah, going mm. up the uh, motorway. So I'm glad I did it, but I did love that about Manchester, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a lovely city. It's it's not perfect like any city, but it's got you know so much charm and mm-hmm. the com- the creative community here is is lovely and it's quite it's quite nice that I don't know if you get this. Um, friends from London will sort of message me now and again and say, so uh, what's it like up there? And you know, wh- wh- where would you recommend living? And is, is yeah. it, has it got a good creative community? And and so you find you're sort of like an ambassador for the city without mm-hmm. being you know an official yeah you know, Very representative. Much so. Very much so as a Yorkshireman, like, you know, I came here, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I just found it incredibly welcoming and people were, you know, really embraced, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I loved that and salt of the earth, you know, the, you, go, you walk into Manchester Centre and you get the most hip London people who've moved up here, <laughs> right through to, you know, old school Gulliver's Dwelling, you know, middle-aged <laughs> men who knew Marquis e. Smith. <laughs> I love it. I, lo- I love Manchester people as well, people who've lived here their whole lives, because they'll just start random conversations with you at the tram stop. And I love that. I absolutely yeah. love that. Um, I need that in my life, yeah. It's yeah, it's a very friendly city. That it stuff, really is. That stuff inspires a lot of my... Uh, my personal work <laughs> yeah definitely and um you you so you write lots of other things you know tell us about stories of the from the apocalypse um is that something that began before the pandemic or is that something that's grown out of yeah it? the title i've thought with well before the pandemic and it you know it's it's actually it was kind of i've never actually put anything out with that title but i'm going to be doing soon i've got a new volume of short stories coming but um stories for the apocalypse came from my sentiment that I, f- I just felt this build that, you know, with everything that was going on with with you know Brexit and Trump and this sequence of kind of dark events, at least for those who see them as dark events. Yeah. It just felt, I felt this underlying sense that people were more on the edge than they had been in the, I guess in that spectrum, like you said, in the world changing in the time I've been a freelancer. Yeah. I felt that more and more people were just kind of, you know, having to find coping mechanisms in certain ways. Definitely. For myriad reasons, but... Um, that was that's what that title came from and then you know the minute I, I kind of called my writing instagram that i've since changed it uh then this pandemic happens and all of a sudden <laughs> it looks like i've come up with this immediately cool title you, you predicted the- it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was complete circumstance that that you know that title fit <laughs> we were revisiting um old episodes of the west wing last night and they were talking about how like you know an outbreak of spot uh, smallpox could be you know spread very fast and they wouldn't mm. be able to get enough vaccinations around in time and and then you know president bartlett did his little speech how you know they would find a way and i'm like well you didn't find a way it was britain that found the way we were first <laughs> class you know yeah. <laughs> sorry sorry americans <laughs> but um yeah and it, it, it i suppose anything i see on the telly now any kind of old movies or any kind of tv series i'll always turn to tom and say quite somberly they they knew what was coming <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a lot of that at the people like to go back and go yeah. oh, they called it <laughs> how did they know wasn't it funny at the start of um lockdown one of the trending movies on netflix was contagion which was based on this whole thing with Kate Winslet. And I'm like, are you all mad? I'm yes. like, we're watching that tonight. <laughs> that's it. I think there's, uh, people do, people like to escape into their dystopian or like disaster kind of TV, don't they? Yeah. Film. Um, but yeah, no, that, that title was complete circumstance. I just happened to come at a time when I'd been writing a lot of, a lot of fiction and it, you know, that was off the back of Champagne and Wax Crayons. And it took me about two, three years after that to muster the confidence to even attempt fiction. Yeah. I've never done it before, you know, why would I? It seemed like much more of a craft that I didn't have this anchor point to being a creative that I could write about all of a sudden. 
So, you know, where do you start? But like everything else we've talked about, you start with what's inside. And as we said, then chance conversation and those odd characters and just the nitty gritty of life that's always been a driver in all the work that I do. I mean, I feel guilty when I like start reading dystopian, apocalyptic <laughs> fiction. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be reading this really. We shouldn't be wishing this upon ourselves. But there's something, <laughs> there's something so luxuriously lovely about the thought of the world <laughs> ending and like how do we as a species continue and yeah. how do we cope? And that, I think that's the thing I find most, most fascinating. It's almost like wiping the slate clean, isn't it? Yeah. I don't want billions of people to die. This I just, is the thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's like I'm a big fan of The Walking Dead and um yeah. and I actually wrote about this in the introduction for what accidentally was my first fiction book called Isolation Watch and it was um it was, a, it was like a fictitious suburban community falling apart during lockdown all done through these tiny little two or three line individual diary entries about fictitious characters. Yeah. It was all observed but it was all put in a fictional context. And in the introduction I said you know I think we've all had that thought that you know, when when life's a bit challenging sometimes that maybe like a, a zombie apocalypse might be more appealing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what really yeah. happened is we're all queuing up outside co-op with two metres between <laughs> each other, yeah. getting pissed off because someone's bought the last toilet rolls. And Absolutely. It's, like, it's just not as romantic. <laughs> watching, I'm watching YouTube videos of people arguing over toilet rolls in supermarkets in America. What's that all about? Yeah. I was like, oh my God, Tom, you need to come and watch this. You know, it's like... <laughs> It's absolutely hilarious. I mean, it, I mean, it's been awful. I mean, we're, we're not trying to trivialise what's happened in the last 18 months no. by far, but we've got to see the the the, the funny side you of the pandemic. To, you, you really have to. It's a human, time. you've got to, it's the only way of coping with everything you that's do. happened. You, and, you have to laugh, you know. <laughs> if it's a controversial giggle, so be it. But it's like, <laughs> but you have to, because it has been really challenging. It has been bleak, for, you know, on a lot of levels. Yeah. Um, and like I say, it's the whole reason I write things like that isolation watch because I have to. Otherwise, it's internalized and I have the classic creative brain where I, I you know, deconstruct things and see yeah. things in layers. And what makes us, I always say it, but what makes us good and well fit for this industry is also like a double edged sword. And it also means we're, procra you know, we're procrastinating and we get down about things mm. and we're very, very sensitive creatures. So. You, you know, laughing is often coping. <laughs> <laughs> I also love the little things people have come out with as well. Like, um, what's the one I always hear again and again? Can you imagine if this happened in the 90s? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my God, yeah. When we were all living in little kind of cul-de-sacs mm, and, God, you yeah, know, no, internet. No, no, no internet, no, no. mobile phones. No Zoom quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's not a bad thing. Landline quizzes. <laughs> Although I did do a Zoom quiz with uh, Barney being the host. Did you? Once. I bet yeah. he was a good host. He was, he was very good, actually. It was when his <laughs> hair was really long, so it added this sort of element of kind of, you know, authority. And um, it, it was hilarious. And and the most funny thing about that quiz, there was uh, Rob, Rob Lomas was on it as well. And he just sat, bless his little heart, just sat very politely staring at the screen. He, he'd been so, so Zoomed out with client Zooms that he just sat there. Barely moving and nodding his head now and again. Like, a wax like, work of himself. Absolutely. I thought it was a cardboard cutout and that he was somewhere else in the, in the background dancing, you know. But anyway, we, we, we all coped with it in our little ways. That's brilliant. So what's this um, new book that you've, um, it's relatively new, isn't it? Your man. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's that all about? Well, it was, I, like I said, it took me a long time to muster the courage to even try fiction. You know, I think I think um, but, but what somebody said this in a talk, and I can't remember who it was. Somebody referred to it as circle of competence, and I think when it comes to kind of roaming within the arts and trying new fields, you know, it's great to have your specialism, the thing that's making you live in. Uh, but there's absolutely nothing wrong, and it's really healthy to explore. But you've got to do it with the personality compass. You know, you've got to make yeah. sure you're doing it that, that it's fit for you. And you, you know, if you hundred percent go into something completely rash and different, that you can fall very short or find that it's a waste of time. Anyway, the writing had obviously come very natural and it took me a good decade to realise that I do have a writer's brain, a very observational brain. You know, I'll, I'll remember photographically, you know, an expression or a comment, that, like we said, at a bus stop or what some old man said that's made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. And I, so I have this vast archive of all this stuff stored up. And what I came to find is that illustration served it to a degree. And I, and I did these projects that were very much hinting at a stronger thread of storytelling. So I did a project called Know What I Mean, and it was just observed items in the street, so beer cans or uh, 
whatever, anything that caught my eye that was not the the big skyscraper that everybody was photographing. You know, I'd be chasing the kebab tray down the road, <laughs> uh, photographing that to do a drawing of it. Um, and it just seemed to, off the back of that, it generated a lot of conversations with people who had that same appreciation for the everyday. And there was an in-joke between a friend of mine who was a sports journalist who had the same sense of humour about found items, you know, that individual shoe you'd see in the middle of the road on a Sunday morning <laughs> yeah. and what's the story behind it. And, yeah. and we would send each other pictures always of the weird items we'd find around. <laughs> and he said, like, your illustration style is so well suited to this. You need to do, like, a montage print of these, he called it British subculture artefacts. Yeah, <laughs> and, love it. And I always loved that idea and I didn't <laughs> act on it for a long time. And at the time when it kind of came back into my mind, I'd started just on my phone as a new parent in this weird brink of exhaustion state of mind writing these little just moments, these things, these experiences I'd had. Some were straight up fiction, some were just actual, you know, real lived experiences given a fictional twist. And the two just seemed to live hand in hand. And I thought, what if I go one step further than just a print with this? Yeah. And actually write a, a very, you know, a very snappy piece of flash fiction to go with each item. And suddenly I thought, that'd make a great book. And oh, God, yeah. I looked into it. And again, luckily, because I've, you know, always been a bit of a traveler around the arts and gone into different fields. I had friends who were writers, friends who were designers and friends who worked in print. So I kind of cobbled together how much it would cost and how I would produce this book independently. And it seemed it was infinitely more affordable than I thought it might be. So I just went ahead and did it. And it was like, you know, partly inspired by people who'd said to me like, oh, you won't be doing that when you're a parent. You know? <laughs> it was like these, this like voice of, you yeah. really don't have time for anything else. And I got my hackles up about it and kind of like, well, I bloody am. And I ended up like doubling down on the, on the output, which is ridiculous. I was already exhausted. But that's what happened. And I thought, why not put this lovely little book out there? And um, I'd stumbled across a writer in Manchester called Austin Collings, who wrote, co-wrote, I think, Marquis Smith's autobiography. And then he wrote all this wonderful little collection of stories, much in that vein. And it was called The Myth of Brilliant Summers. And it's a wonderful little book. Um, and an artist called Ray Richardson, a painter in London that I became friends with, lent me the book and said, I think you'll like this. You like your kind of down and dirty stories. So Austin's work kind of reminded me that there's great value in, in our own experiences, that actually my little grubby stories of off licenses in Yorkshire <laughs> in the 90s and stuff <laughs> have got value. And there is an audience for that, you know? So that's essentially what your mum was. And I just did this book and it was quite well received and, you know, really got me going as a, as a fiction writer as well. And, you know, the illustration, I, I've got this, I guess, this unique ability to illustrate my own work, which a lot of writers don't have for obvious reasons, because it's a whole different field. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of make good on that and do this illustrated book of all these mucky little stories. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so what um, are you going to be sort of taking with you from the last couple of years into sort of the next year and what's kind of next for you on the agenda? So I'm still uh, like hugely passionate about my writing at the moment. But what that's done is it's it's reframed my illustration because that's still paying my bills and I absolutely am still passionate about it. But it's the, between the two, I find I can make these projects where it gets the best of both, you know? Mm. Um, and then as always seems to happen, it opens doors that you wouldn't expect. So because I started putting this writing out there more and I built an author website, I was contacted by a, an editor at The Guardian who I worked with when she worked in the sport department years ago and used to commission me to do sport editorial illustrations. And she said, I'm in a different section of the paper now and where we're commissioning a series of graphic novels, very short comics. Um, and it was called the Illustrated Cities series. Mm -hmm. But they would go to an illustrator and say, you know, we'd, we'd like your take on the place you live or a place you're fond of. It didn't have to be where they were based. Yeah. We'd love you to do one. And, you know, it doesn't have to be Manchester, but I, I love Manchester and I, I, the, the chance to explore it visually. Um, was great and she also wanted me to write it because I'd shown that you know I was doing this writing and calling myself a writer now so to bring those two skills together and get commissioned to do it and get paid to do both things was a huge buzz you know um, the longer you do it you tend to find that the jobs that give you that level of buzz are a bit less often you yeah know, because it, you know there comes a point with any of us where it's just what you do and it's your job yeah so that was a huge thrill to get to get paid to do my writing as well and it just goes to show that by doing and by putting it out there, you, you can find ways to make it work, which is awesome. Absolutely incredible. And, and was it difficult to add writer to your kind of job title? Yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> very much so. You know, you, we do, we tend to wrap our identities up in, in, yeah. in the profession that we do in the arts, which is great because it tends to come from the personality. So 
that's kind of what we should do. But yeah. then sometimes it that makes it can kind of trap you in that profession, you know. So to see that actually the the fundamental thread through podcast, through writing, through my artwork, it's all the same. It all comes from that haphazard personality and the things that I love. It's just that it can live in different mediums, you yeah. know. So so moving forward, very much still a full time illustrator, but slowly but surely building this you know this writer thing up alongside it. And, and being careful not to go back to the bull in a china shop thing and go, <laughs> I have to make money from it now. I have to be getting commissioned for it now. It's like, no, no, no. You're making your living from the dream profession, which is illustration. So really do the same thing that you did and, and, and build the writing with purity. And, you know, who knows? Maybe something else will come from it. I don't know. I'm never going to close myself off to change and to going down different paths. But, you know, so yeah, it's, it's just a, a lovely thing to be able to bounce between the different disciplines and cross them over. Well, in hearing about how you found yourself, I hope we help uh, many others who are listening to this find them themselves and what they fi- feel really passionate about and they can mm-hmm. move forward into this kind of new era, this new dawn. Definitely. And if you feel strong, if you feel up, down, whatever it is about, whatever's going on in the world and in your life, harness that stuff because mm. the way you feel about it is unique. You might not think so. And there might be uh, you know millions of other people that share to a degree, the sentiment, but there's only your, you know, we've all got a very unique journey through life. I know journey is a very cliched word, but we, <laughs> but we do. We, 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 we do. all have a unique path of events. No one person has got your story. So maximize that because it is what art directors and editors, it's what they look out for. They want to be shocked and into something new. You know, they want the uh, whole new way of thinking. And it doesn't matter that you're just coming out of uni, you've all got that. So yeah, okay, be an illustrator, be whatever it is you're choosing to do, but very much use you at the centre of that because, you know, when you're new, the confidence is quite low and you are fragile. But believe me, every single one of you have got that unique story and it's golden and you have to use that. You know, you have to find ways to manifest it. And when you do, it's the best feeling, but it is also what will open doors and get you the big paid commissions, you know? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you ever so much, Ben. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for sharing a cup of tea with me on this Tuesday morning. Well, I wouldn't have had it any other way. It's the best way to spend a Tuesday morning. <laughs> to find out more about Ben Talon, check out our show notes at creativeboom.com forward slash podcast. That's where you can also subscribe and enjoy weekly episodes from us every Monday morning. Thanks again to our sponsor, Capture One, one of the most powerful photo editing softwares out there. Use the code CREATIVEBOOM for a 10% discount or sign up for a free 30-day trial at CaptureOne.com. Next time, I'll be chatting with Anusha Syed, a Pakistani-Canadian freelance illustrator and character designer for animation based in Toronto. Toronto.